Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, From Script to Screen, Storytelling with a Different Lens with myself, Kylie Ellis, and Oz Not Sure, the producer of Walt Disney Animation Studios, Moana, and Riot the Last Dragon. Before we get started, um, I wanted to do uh, say a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, if you have questions, please put it into the Q&A section on, uh, in Zoom as opposed to in chat. It'll be easier for us to track. And also there's going to be someone keeping an eye out in chat just in case questions pop up there. And now I'd like to respectively acknowledge and recognize that I live and work and Spark is hosted on the stolen territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I give thanks to the land protectors past and present and future. Without them, I would not feel as fortunate as I do to call these lands my home. And I would like to welcome Osnat. Welcome. It's nice to see you again. Nice to see you. And thank you for um, requesting permission for us to speak. Let's get started, shall we? Mm -hmm. I'm sure I would love to start with hearing a bit about your career journey, how you got started, and how you ended up where you are now. It's a big question, small question. It's a huge question because I'm <laughs> old. That's why. <laughs> I had a long career journey. Um, well, I'm from Israel. I was uh, born in Israel. My, my parents were as well. They were freedom fighters in the beginnings of the country. And then I grew up all over the world. And uh, my father was with the Israeli airline. And um, I, I tell you that because it became part of, I think, of, of why I made some of the choices I made over time. My father was a very avid photographer. And I lived part of my childhood in Africa. And um, we used to make these little Super 8 films and then come back and then kind of, you know, make little titles. Like we made little films with this tiny, tiny little um, edit thing that we would use as sort of, you know, tiny, like almost a miniature movie. So um, it sort of started me off on a journey and I came back um, to Israel. And then I honestly, I thought I wanted to be an actor. And, um, I was, just, I, I was auditioning for Tel Aviv University, a very good uh, drama area there, and realized during the audition process that actually so many times, that's all I wanted to do. <laughs> I just like, I took off, I went to New York, yeah. I pitched things together, I went to NYU as I could, and to new school, learned film, um, wanted to learn every single thing there is to, to learn from, from idea and script writing through to I would shadow people in the projection room. I was like, oh, I have to learn this language. I'm a filmmaker. And um, then took a very circuitous route over time. I did documentaries for a long time. Um, I actually started off as an editor. My first job out of film school, film 16 millimeter. And I remember like trying to keep all these pieces I'm dating myself here, but <laughs> pieces of film up on the little nails in the thing, and I was like, this is not for me. I love editors. I think it's such an incredible way, such a, a creative part of filmmaking. I'm like, I need people. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is not working. And so one thing led to another. I did docs for a long time. I did a lot of um, interactive work in its early days before we all had interactive on our cell phones. There were, there were you know, there was some, some serious like, I, laser discs maybe <laughs> I came at the end of that all right I'm not that old but um did different various things made a lot of documentaries made a lot of uh, mockumentaries as well dramatizations things like that and found my way into Pixar and in the Bay Area almost like I had done a lot of production I'd done a lot of film work traveled a lot in theater and I had one of those and I'll come back to this later but I I was lucky enough to be interviewed for the role there of um, the head of the shorts group that became the, I became the executive producer of the group that did everything that wasn't the feature that was up. Mm -hmm. All the promotions, DVD materials, I started a documentary team that just got um, nominated for an Emmy. Like it, it was a lot of fun. It was a growth time at Pixar and um, it was an interesting 
challenge because we were like the um, the speedboat while the feature was the cruise ship. You know, you turn mm -hmm. the wheel and three days later it turns. We're just like whizzing <laughs> through it, and making short films and making dog things. And when you're working with people like I don't know, Brad Bird, he's like, what have we filled the whole disc already? Can let's make another one. How about we do uh and we were just it was just too too much fun to not do. So yeah, I got hired at Pixar off of um my production chops, not my animation chops. I learned animation on the job. I had done a few projects to mm -hmm. be fair, but they were small, they weren't Pixar level. And um, but the head of production there at the time. Um, she felt that if you have that production, I think you'd probably agree with this because you're a producer too. If you can recognize that production chop in someone, that gene at the very beginning of their um, journey. And it's not for everyone. And there's a lot yeah. of people who uh, do so much better in other roles that are still needed to make the film. But that production gene, a friend once described it like um, when, um, the race car driver, the good ones can sort of see a pattern of how to get there. And that's kind yeah. of what we do. So I was at Pixar, I headed up the shorts group, we made original shorts, super fun, met incredible people, did all the promotional materials for each of our films that released. I was there from Nemo on for quite a while, made uh, documentaries for the DVDs, which was sort of my throwback and a chance to have fun. Um, we did all the theme park rides and Pixar was just exploding at the time. We were the new Disney characters for the theme parks. And then um, I actually, um, when Pixar was bought by Disney, I left to do my own thing for a while. It was, it was a good moment for me to do that. And I was developing some projects and then got lucky enough to find my way back into Disney, but this time at Disney Animation Studios um, as the head of development, I was VP of development. And um, it was a great time to be there. It was flourishing and growing and we had, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, so many projects in development, including Moana. And that, was that the draw to, to go back to Disney was because of the, the yes. stories? You know, Part of it was um, that incredible luxury of making these projects with such incredible artists. Like, I don't even have to find them. They're already there. Mm -hmm. And that, mm -hmm. that was a big draw because these projects, animated films are a result of, of, of artists, artists, technologists, uh, they're all artists. Hundreds of them on Ryan the Last Dragon, there were you know over 400 of us from home, but putting their stamp on the screen. And when you have excellent crews like this and such a commitment for which I know are everywhere, and then the commitment to let them be as good as they can yeah. be in the service of a story and of a commitment to make the story as good as it needs to be, even when it doesn't seem at the surface like a good business decision. I love that because I'm a creative person and um, much as I need us to, I need my team to meet some deadlines <laughs> goals and budgets. And it's stuff. always a conversation, right? Yeah. <laughs> I agree though that, you know, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well because it's so hard to mm -hmm. do these. Why don't you tell me a little bit about Moana and and the journey from script to screen there because it's such a beautiful story and it translates so well and it's been it, it's one of the most popular even with adults I was just talking to a group of colleagues today and they're like yeah I listen to it all the time the music and the story and, and that so let's start there yeah I, I got really lucky to be part of Moana from so early on. It was one of the projects that was in development. There were nine different projects in development when I was heading it up and it was, they're all great, but there was something about this one. And there were two things that really, um, not nah, more than two, quite a few things that made me <laughs> really be drawn to it. One was that we were talking about a lot together about creating strong female protagonists, which is sort of my thing that's very, very, very close to my heart. How do we change these perceptions? How do we change representation of women in media? Not just to have representation, but just to be full-fledged mm -hmm. 
with relationships, heroes of their own stories, all of that. The cultures that it was that we're, we're looking to start getting inspiration from, as I started doing the research, I just fell in love. The, the beauty of, and it's not just, hey, this is a gorgeous setting. Everyone knows me because the guns are stunning, but the depth of the history and of the culture and how mm -hmm. little we all know about it just seemed like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. And then meeting these people that have stayed friends um, that started off as cultural consultants or people we met at the island on the islands or our, our whatever choreographer, there is this um, incredibly hopeful perspective on our place in nature and in the world. To me, it's incredibly hopeful because if we're all family, if I'm family with a tree and, and if the ocean is sentient and if we all want the same thing, then I will treat nature quite differently than if it's just there, mm -hmm. right? it's just there for me to use up and throw away. And so there's something in that insight that I think made its way into one of that beating us over the head. It's, a, it's an adventure story um, that, that drew my heart. And so, um, and then of course there's Ram and Jama. I mean, I was working with people who created some of the most iconic animated films that everyone grew mm -hmm. up on, you know? Um, so to get to work with them where they bring their mastery of Nobody else would have in a hundred years thought of that ocean alive and that, um, you know, that little animated Maui conscience. It's just so, such deep love of un animated storytelling. And yet they were changed by their trip to the islands and by, our, by the people that they connected with there as well. And seeing that makes you feel like you can say something. And then you collect people like Bokataya Fawali and Lynn Manuel Miranda and Dwayne Johnson and Ali and, and all the incredible people on our on our team internal and our story trust. And um, it becomes something that means it's meaningful and important because mm -hmm. um, it was for us. So hopefully it. Yeah. I actually have a question here for you in regards to Moana. Uh, was there a scene in Moana that wasn't expected to, to turn out that way? What was your favorite scene moment of the film that you feel was vi visualized perfectly? Oh my God, how much time do you have? Um, <laughs> well, we have about 40 <laughs> minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Half so an here's, hour, maybe. <laughs> here's, uh, here's a couple of things. One, to know that there is not one scene in that film that didn't change. Everything changes in our stories. We, we do about five to eight screenings of the full film and we don't start production until the middle of that. Uh, the first story with Moana, in fact, the first story was Maui based, but the first um, story real, we made Moana had seven older brothers. And like there's, this, our stories evolve at its heart though, Moana always, the, um, the incredible, revelation to us of the wayfinders and of the navigation of the way that people moved with intention mm -hmm. across the Pacific, the understandings that we got from the elders that we talked to and from our own experiences about um, the idea that the ocean connects us, not separates us. It's a Pacific Island idea that we are the islands and the ocean. And there's a Western idea that we're islands separated from each other. And yeah. so what does that mean? So we were inspired by a lot of things. I'd say um, the scene that we, it was the first full scene we animated was young Moana, baby Moana, receiving the heart of Tefiti from the ocean. And part of that is it was storyboarded by the brilliant, brilliant uh, director Chris Williams. And just for us to kind of push on how does the ocean express? And we animated it and it was gorgeous and we loved it and we fell in love with it and we wanted it. And suddenly it didn't fit in the story for a while because for a moment, for our story reasons, and any of you who've been in story rooms, you know how we spin, but for our story reasons, we wanted her to meet the ocean at an older age, when we're with her, not when she's younger. Thank goodness it found its way back, because it's one of the most beautiful scenes in a film that I know. My personal favorite, there was a huge breakthrough for us, and I remember the moment when that happened, is when um, Moana, is coming towards Taka. This is not who you mm -hmm. are. Singing that beautiful 
song that's in counter melody to that gorgeous song that that we heard when she first met the ocean that that Opatai Fwai wrote. And Lin Manuel had to find that kind of counter melody and that those pithy simple lyrics, but we didn't know exactly how we'd, we would visualize it. And suddenly Ron Clements, one of the two directors, jumped up in the room and said, what if we try this? And he described this idea that usually you only see in music videos where the singer is singing in real time, but everything is moving, including the ocean in slow motion. And it was brilliant, like everything came together. And I can't see that scene without um, yeah, tearing up. So I think it's such a such a beautiful scene of, to me, that's such a feminine. I don't mean man, woman, feminine, but feminine in our in feminine our energy. Of, yeah, way of solving. Yeah, the big big threatening problem. You know, is by <laughs> understanding and forgiving and seeing through your the rage of the other to the heart that was hurt. You know, with what I'm hearing is that it was a real collaboration process. And, you know, with the um, consultants that you engaged, you formed friendships. And were they along for the whole journey, the, the consultants? Uh, yeah, it's something that's really important, I think, when, you, when, when you're um, being inspired by another culture, even if it's your culture you grew up in, it doesn't matter, but by a culture um, that it's not a conversation that starts and stops. It's a conversation <laughs> that continues. First of all, we collected people simply by, all right, we're gonna doing this whole thing, for example, with tattoos. Well, people we'd already met connected us to the tattoo master who's in an unbroken lineage of 10 tattoo masters. His father just passed it to him. But he's a really fun, cool guy, Peter. And um, he's still in Samoa. And so he became part of our story trust because we needed a master tattoo. Mm -hmm. on it who can help us get them right and, 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 and say it in the right way. Uh, we had a, a choreographer. And so as we're going along, whenever there's dance, Tiana and some of our dancers from Nomosina, they're actually in Orange County, um, would come and we would have the animators there and we would choreograph the dance and they would do it. And we'd have some, you know, whoever it was, like the Maui dance, for example, all of that, so that was ongoing. Our key consultant on Moana, and we had a similar consultant in a similar seat on Raya, um, is um, a, an anthropologist by the name of Dion Fonotti from um, the University of Samoa, who we would literally send every design to that we did in art before it went for legal clearance. We would go for Dion to take a look. Dion also knows what she doesn't know because she's an academic and also would know who to ask. And mm -hmm. so, so that we're clear, so that we're trying to take the inspiration from the right era, from the right um, design. I'll give you an example of something that you hear from somebody and we didn't think about. So we research and we find that people actually use incredible like face paint um, from natural materials. And also the thing that was a really precious were red feathers that only royals would wear red. So you'd have these beautiful headdresses and stuff. And so when we know the way, we're like, and the ancestors are coming, and we have them with these gorgeous red feather headdresses, and it's animated, fully, not yet lit. And Good luck. Dion, <laughs> and Dion sees it and goes, guys, they've been on the water for weeks. This is hard work, and you're sprayed with water and storms and all that. You would not be wearing your prized, like, if it was your diamond tiara, you know, you would mm -hmm. not be wearing it on the boat like that even if it's a celebration, we're like, oh my God, you're so right. Where it's as, if you think about the reality of what they were doing, they would be ready to be on the water for three, four weeks. And so we um, fixed it. <laughs> but things like that happen a lot. Mostly you get ahead of it, but also you get ideas and inspiration from um, storytellers, from people who wanna share with us um, some of their study of the mythology, of the history, of the new uh, archaeology that's now things that they're finding and some of the mm -hmm. myths and stories around that. So it's a constant ongoing conversation. We're so into collaboration anyway. We have story room as you know, 10, 11 people with yeah. you, plus a writer, plus some directors, plus, you know, that um, it's just to open up the collaboration one step more into a really important um, conversation in particular, continue that conversation as you're presenting your film to the world as well, just so that 
um, those same, that same knowledge you have, we have, we gained along the film goes, Disney in particular goes out to anyone who is referring back to the film publishing or whatever. Mm -hmm. Parks. You know, with the, the characters, the water, the ocean is also a character. So uh, there's another question that's popped up that it's, you know, not particularly an animal, creature, human, but it has a character unto itself. So it has a goofy, playful side to it. What uh, was the process in designing and animating the ocean to portray its personality? Did you reference it off anything? I mean, considering it doesn't have any facial expressions or hand gestures. Yeah, we thought about that a lot um, to try to understand it. Um, and what some wonderful visual development artists started doing a study of the ways, different ways the ocean is and equating it with what emotion it made us feel. You know, is the ocean angry? Is the ocean excited? We looked at that. We looked, of course, studied ocean, talked to oceanographers, mm -hmm. uh, did, did that thing we do, studied waves. Um, wave machines to understand it and then thought about here's where it was where it kind of came from the idea um, the team was in Fiji out on a, a canoe that was homemade um, out in the lagoon with a talking chief of this group that built their own canoe and are still navigators in the Asian arts and his name's Angel and he and one of our directors he admitted it himself so I'm okay to say it doesn't swim and there was, there was no life vest involved, let me just say. So um, it's a shallow lagoon, thank goodness. But, and what, um, what he said when, he, when he, he sort of caressed the ocean angel and he said, you know, the ocean is sentient. The ocean knows what you're feeling. So if you feel no fear, everything will be okay. And he told a story where people who did fear it wasn't okay. Being animation, you come away from an experience like that, which by the way, afterwards was like dinner with the, all the generations and the kids and you're by the water. And, and the people said, it's Wednesday night, it's hymn night. Do you mind if we sing some of our hymns? And so it's all these hymns, but with these gorgeous Pacific Island um, mm -hmm. harmonies. So of course they come away from that with the ocean is alive. In our movie, the ocean will be alive because they're animated, they're longtime animators. And so then we started thinking about how would it actually express itself? So then we have another secret tool, which is some of the, the most amazing 2D animators in the world, like Eric Goldberg, Mark Hen. And so they did some pencil study ideas. Like how could the, well, what would the water do? How would it be playful with her as a child? Meantime, a scene, a sort of scene is written in Chris Williams who I uh, was one of the directors of Big Hero 6, and a, a, a wonderful artist, volunteered, because everyone loves Ron and John, to storyboard an idea for how that, how mm -hmm. the ocean could speak. We knew we didn't want a face. We knew we didn't want, you know, um, because we weren't trying to say that sentience depends on, you know, to us, you know, the ability to talk in the way that humans talk. And it would just be cooler and so he did some amazing drawings. So all this comes together. And then our, um, it, it did go through modeling. There was a model of that, just that um, wave, <laughs> she had a name. And w where the, it's the one that kind of has the, the most expression. So animation would draw it out, but of course effects had to jump in and um, lighting and mm -hmm. yeah. So it was, a, Again, super collaborative. It was a great idea on paper and then actually realizing it was even more fun because we had seen nothing like that before. We wanted to feel fresh, but also to express what the Islanders feel, which is that the ocean is alive. And a challenge to execute as well. Yes, it was quite a challenge. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's his creative unto its own right <laughs> i know it turns out we were you know 80 percent on water so oops yeah yeah i want to jump to i guess raya for a moment as well because i i watched it recently and just the story itself I, i'm feeling that maybe the same journey you with the you had consultants along the way and can you talk a bit about where that story sparked from 
Yeah, there was um, there was an idea that was already kicking around in the studio that had to do with the dragon, and it was the the Asian dragon, the, the dragon who's connected to water and to hope, you know, um, not the European one, which is a whole different take. And that mm -hmm. there are five lands around it, and they're almost like represent parts of the dragon, and they're at odds, and we want to bring together the pieces of the parts of the dragon. And we did have the idea of this character. We're very drawn to it. She used to be even more uh, sort of, how do I say, Clint Eastwoody, you know, kind of a little bit like a Western in terms of um, a character who really had pulled away. But as it developed, we thought a lot, a lot about what, what it is we want to say. And we were thinking about coming together, about collaboration. What does it mean to overcome your differences and come together? So we dug deeper and it actually took us a few years to arrive at, at different versions of it, to arrive at this understanding of this idea that actually somebody does have to take the first step and that requires mm -hmm. a certain kind of trust. What does trust mean? And so almost the, 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 the thesis of the film is almost the two points of view. Raya's in a broken world, you can't trust anyone. Sisu's who represents life and everything is, you know, anything is possible. Maybe the world is broken because we don't trust each other, you know, and you can turn it, you can change it that way. And so that grew and became, we always knew we wanted an ensemble. We understood as we went, worked our way through it that we want someone from each of the lands. Originally, some of the characters were in different lands, but one of the lands mm -hmm. only had monkeys. And we realized we wanted a human there because um, Noi, who's one of my favorite characters, our, our hustler baby, she was actually connected with Tong. So um, different things happened along the way. But one of the things that we really dug deep into is world building. And what does mm -hmm. that mean? And how does that express itself? And as uh, one of our production designers, Helen Cheng, will tell you, um, it's like the design five movies. I mean, this is a very big Oh, movie. for sure. Yeah. There's a lot of, not cheating, set extension. Set extension isn't cheating. It's its own art form. But there's a lot um, that implies a lot, a lot that we have design that we mm -hmm. never visited because we stayed on the river. But in terms of the Southeast Asian inspiration, this was a great evolution for us. We were um, looking at um, this idea of people coming together despite differences. And, and the team went on the first research trip and it was to Southeast Asia, it's five different countries. Southeast Asia is multiple countries, 650 million people, hundreds of cultures and languages. So it's not like a, a, a single culture at all. But in all five countries, one of the things that everyone was struck with, and this is our, some of our artists and our co-directors, was with all the multiplicity of these ethnicities and of cultures and of religions coming together, there is this coming together and a working together and a sense of we that is so, that was such a teaching and it was such an embodiment of what we wanted to do. And you can taste it in the street food. It shouldn't go together because it's this and it's salty and it's sweet and it's this and it's the best street food in the world. It, you feel it in the, in some of the, the, the vibrancy of the culture, certainly mm -hmm. in some of the um, ceremonies we went to in Bali, things like that. So we came back committed to connecting, to, to, to digging deeper and understanding that more. So one of the first people we engaged on our Southeast Asian Story Trust was, um, we found this, it was an amazing thing, a visual cultural anthropologist um, who is Lao, Dr. Steve Arunsak, who also studies all of kind of cultural anthropology for Southeast Asia and um, was, was easy for us to, to reach. And he became such an incredible resource. And we built a bigger team around that. We had a linguist and a dancer who helped us with movement and mm -hmm. um, everything from how do, you how do you take off your shoes before you go into uh, the inner shrine and keep them tidy, but without having touched them with your hands? <laughs> Which we would go, and you go, I need a video. Now, it's an animation. And she'd send back a video. And you're like, oh, right. To um, the martial arts. The martial arts are all inspired by Southeast Asian martial arts. Producer Miracle, one of our writers, Queen Wen, um, was a, a martial arts choreographer, uh, you know, and he's Southeast Asian, and that's his expertise. So while he brought on this wonderful person, Maggie McDonald, we also helped bring it into character and 
uh, connected to the Southeast Asian inspiration. So it was always touch point to figure out have we found that connecting link or if it's specific to somewhere, because in the room, just in the creative room, we had Adele, Adele Lynn, she's, she grew up in Malaysia. She's uh, a first script writer, then a Kui Gwen. Kui grew up in the United States, but his parents came from Vietnam. He's very connected to his culture. Von Vera Thorne, our head of stories, Thai, grew up in Thailand, very connected. Mm -hmm. And then our whole team and other people on the crew. So in the room, you had an instant gut check. Somebody would say, oh, what if it was, um, you know, that thing where the, that my mom would put on the table when we came home from school. Oh my God, your mom did that too. We did that in Thailand too, but we did it in Malaysia. And so you'd find all these common things as well as common, like more academic design principles and like that. So it's, it's, a, it's an evolutionary process, but it has to stay with you all throughout um, in order, I think, to really work. Did you have a key person that kind of helped sort of guide the story as a whole that had was well but from a consultant perspective or a director from you know someone from within the community of the South Asian community that was very key in that storytelling but yes. you know you have yeah. your your team but was there one person that kind of helped lead the charge that way I think the, the triumvirate honestly of Adele, mm -hmm. Kui, and Fawn, who are all in the key storytelling room. It's the writers, the head of story, mm -hmm. the director, me, basically an editor. Um, within, from within the group, we're constantly aware, even just from lived experience, not just from studied experience. And we would bring in our trust at different touch points when there was a screening that I was getting notes from our, you know, brain, more brain trust, our story trust we get notes from our um, Southeast Asia Story Trust as well. Mm -hmm. But the key consultant from the group of consultants that I had was definitely Dr. Arun Sack. He was with us working through some things. Um, the dragon, for example, is revered primarily in most places in Southeast Asia, and sometimes yeah. in Naga, it's revered. And so we work together on the design. We work together on figuring out how her crest in still images that were going out how it's higher than anyone else's eyeline because that's respect. Those kinds of things always run through Steve before they went anywhere. Um, yeah, we're building to him. But for in the, within the room, we had three. And, and the cool thing was, is that they were from three slightly different cultures that represent other groups in Southeast Asia. So that was my first touch point. And then we instantly had the trust. They were available by text. Like, help the gamelan you know, whatever <laughs> whatever it is and they're always there and so helpful or we'd go to our uh, linguist who's indonesian and just go okay the latest is we think we want to call her raya tell me what you think because i know it's this and i know it's this and we would you know instantly i like i need it by midnight <laughs> and um to go and study and ask and come back so everyone takes responsibility for it but i have to say those three at the very heart of the of the kind of story, mm -hmm. it was priceless. Really lucky because they're also just awesome at what they do. They weren't brought on because they came from somewhere. So they're it was a really lucky, wonderful. Um, yeah, very fortuitous, serendipitous. <laughs> exactly. Okay. I'm going to move it to um, Vancouver and yes. Disney and and such because I think you know, there is some excitement knowing that Disney's coming back to Vancouver. Do you want to maybe touch on that a little bit and what that means for Disney? Yes, a hundred percent. You know, for us, we're expanding. We're like, we're like throwing mm -hmm. open the party, <laughs> you know, getting one more, one more ballroom. Um, I think for us, the exciting thing is to, first of all, come and connect with the incredible talent that's, that's, um, bubbling in Vancouver and all the, the fresh, fresh sense of, of um, new ideas and things we can play with. For me personally, we're going to, like the, the building of the studio and the, and the creation of the show I'm now working on, which is the um, basically Moana sequel in the, in the form of, uh, of a long form series for Disney Plus that you've all heard about. Um, so we're doing that together. And um, for me, Moana is like a joy I want to share. And I think that's what's happening now as people are jumping on the canoe as well, even from the, from the beginnings of, of uh, our mm -hmm. story. And 
our um, editor and our production designer from the original and all sorts of exciting things. Um, people saying, hey, how can, how can we be part of it? And to be able to take that, I, you know, and, and open that up into Vancouver. And then working with Amir, who I just think rocks and all the, <laughs> like, it feels like reconnecting with old friends, meeting new friends. And in Vancouver, like how much more beautiful can the location be, right? Today, it's gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> when do you think uh, things will be starting up production-wise? Because I'm, I'm sure that's going to be we're, a question. We're starting, you know, uh, um, Ramir is working with some of the team here on um, all sorts of postings, so be on the lookout. Um, and we're going to start building. We're in story now, and um, we're looking at coming out, uh, you know, summer 2024 is announced. So, you know, do your math. Um, we're going to start <laughs> production soon. And um, obviously, putting together their infrastructure, which think, you know, again, thank goodness we're all here. Um, and, and everybody in the studio here rallying to create mm -hmm. that kind of sister studio, you know, the excitement of that. Um, we're starting to roll. It all depends how quickly things come together because we're just, we're just starting. Days. And yet we're gonna hit the ground running, but there'll be, there's great training programs being put in place and, um, a lot of open conversation to just talk about what it is we're going to do, how we're thinking, how 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 we want to make sure we structure ourselves so that we can mm -hmm. do the kind of work we do, which is all together as filmmakers make the best show we can that we're all proud of, rather than just kind of handing the ball across any kind of uh, net to anyone. That's our dream. That's how we work, and um, to add more people into that, yeah. Why not? We have a couple minutes left. Is there anything you wanted to touch on that we haven't? Um, I, I, I've had the, the great good fortune of being in a number of different studios and every one of them, I think it's animation people who make this, mm -hmm. uh, it's true of every, of, of <laughs> every kind of work, but I came from live action and you, you build this great culture and community and then it, you know, we, that's that's a wrap, and you know, you might work together again, you might not. Um, what I've found, both when I worked at Pixar and here at Disney, is like there's a family building kind of quality to it, where um, we work together a lot, and so you start um, being able to um, get more and more of the best out of each other, and to trust each other more and more, and to see each other as co-filmmakers telling the story. I can tell you on Ryan the Last Dragon, suddenly one day they tell us we're going home and we just animated the first two shots. Like we're in production now for a year, 400 homes. We don't know how we're gonna do this. And what developed on the level of trusting each other and of the directors being able to really articulate what they're looking for and people doing the best work we'd all ever seen despite the circumstances because of this kind of, um, we're doing this thing together, even when mm -hmm. we're doing it apart. So hopefully for anyone who gets the chance to join us, that's what Amir wants to build. That's what I wanna build. That's what all of us who think about this wanna make is more of that, more of that cool Disney, like, boy, am I proud of that thing we all made together feeling when we do it right and we're gonna all try and do it. <laughs> Thank you, Osnat, for your time today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you in Vancouver soon when you, you know Vancouver. travel is a little freer. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thanks very much. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>